Hello, today is April 9th, uh, 2021. My name is Renan Perez. I'm interviewing Sarah Perez for the University Library Speech Collections and Archives at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, hereafter abbreviated as UTRGV. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at University of Austin, Texas. Please know, Mrs. Please know, Ms. Perez, that uh, this interview will be placed in the, the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTV and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wish. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please uh, bring it up and we'll talk about it. The University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview along with another uh, along with other photographs and other documentation that you are willing to share. UTRGV, a university library, will retain copyright and non-exclusive right to the interview and any other material you donate to special collections and archives at UTRGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record a, your consent to, to make sure that you agree with the, our interview procedures before we continue. So I'll ask a series of six questions. Please say yes, I agree, or no, or I do not agree after each question. Okay? Yes. Do you give uh, university libraries a special collections and archives that UTRGV consent it to archive your interview and your material at the UTRGV University Library? Yes, I agree. Do you grant UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives write a title and interest in copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post the interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people in the world? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the University uh, library special collections and archives consent to share your Zoom interview with Wilson's Oral History Center and uh, the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of, of, a, pan over, uh, of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which uh, will include posting the interview on the internet? Yes, I agree. All right. As you recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form, we use information from the pre-interview form to help research the entire or, uh, form is uh, kept in a secure Voices server at the University of, Austin, the University of uh, Texas at Austin. The board Voices sends it to uh, UTRG University Library Special Collections and Archives. Uh, we would have uh, stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members, so that will not be a part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRG University Library. The final two questions uh, to ask you for your consent on what I just described. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your file available to researchers at UTRG University Library Special Collections and Archives? Yes, I agree. On occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and Voices uh, receives uh, requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legit news outlets. You give consent for us to share your, your phone numbers or email with journalists. Yes, I agree. Thank you for your consent. Your experience and stories mean a lot to, to us at the UTRGV. Uh, special collections and archives. I look forward to what you say in the interview questions I will now ask. Thank you, okay. Mr. Uh, for your cooperation and uh, for, for being willing to share your lived experience during uh, the time of COVID for the Voices uh, of a Pandemic uh, project. Considering you have uh, moved jobs uh, from uh, being a a from being in the practice as a private duty nurse to transitioning to becoming a middle school nurse in the midst of an ongoing pandemic and having to balance the duties of being a wife, mother, and grandmother. I'm excited to dive deeper and hear your stories that you will share 
or uh, pertaining it to uh, COVID and how you will manage it moving forward with life. So before I ask you to share stories about OJ, your life in uh, this pandemic, it got, oh, I'm sorry, a correction. Uh, I'm meant to say uh, becoming an elementary school nurse. Um, so before I ask your or uh, stories about your life in the pandemic, uh, tell us who is Sara Perez. Uh, my name is Sarah Perez. I am a, I am 56 years old. I was born in Ed Couch, Texas. I'm a wife, mother, and um, I, I work as a school nurse at the moment. So the first question I want to ask you is, uh, when did you first hear about COVID-19? How did you learn about it? Uh, either through radio, TV, children, social media, et cetera? Okay, I first heard about um, COVID-19 through the media, mostly as I do not follow, uh, uh, participate with any social media, but I did, would started hearing it in the media um, when it was at the first stages where actually here in the US, it was being said that it was nothing, that we should not worry about it, that it was something like, would be something like the flu. It would not affect um, us too much. It, it was mainly, you know, older people would get affected by it. And uh, so at, at that time, it, it wasn't something, I didn't think that it was something we would have to worry about too much. Um, is that all? Yes. All right. What was your first reaction to the information uh, about COVID-19? My first reaction, well, like I said, because at the beginning it was being played as it wasn't something really bad. So just thought something that it was gonna pass, you know, quickly um, with the days following that it started, we started hearing more and more about it. And then cases started showing up here in the US and then here in the Valley where I'm from, that's when it started getting kind of worrisome and then started hearing, it wasn't only affecting the older generation, it was affecting middle-aged people, younger people. And that's when it became concerning uh, it was, it started being scary and, you know, um, thinking of what, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, at what point did you realize that this pandemic was serious, uh, uh, was a serious life altering event or do you not think it's serious and why? Oh, no, it, it, it I believe maybe like, um, what was it like in, May, June, that we started hearing more of the cases. And then when when actually it hit more, when we started, and personally family members that uh, contracted the, the virus and friends, and we started seeing the seriousness of it. And that's when like the county government started shutting down um, starting with curfews and that's when it really got very real that this is something very that's something that we need to worry about over the last uh, few months uh what news media social media or other sources do you rely on to keep your information about uh coronavirus mainly uh well a lot of it on the social media and now that um I'm employed with the school district. We follow uh, what the CDC guidelines are. Uh, that's what we base our mostly everything on. Whatever the CDC is recommending, that's what we follow within uh, school district. So we rely on, on what the CDC is say, telling us. And of course, the, the local government as well. Mm -hmm. Um, can you share with me uh, what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease and any of its variants? Likewise, can you share with me what you don't understand 
about uh, this new coronavirus? Okay, what I don't understand, I guess, too much about the coronavirus because I haven't uh, been following so much of it in the media is, you know, this new variants, how it, it's affecting. And now that the vaccines are here, um, is it gonna help those new variants or do we need, and I know that we still keep, need to keep following the guidelines, the six feet apart, the mask, the mask, wearing the masks, you know, um, washing our hands, things like that. And, but I, what I'm not understanding is, are these variants, you know, can these vaccines help with these new variants of, of COVID that, that we're starting to hear about? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what you do understand about the disease? What I do, I mean, now like, um, the, what I've heard now is like people that are contracting it, a lot of them, you know, are not getting as, as sick as they were before, they're recovering faster, I would say. Um, you know, that's, there are not so many people in the ICU. There's not, you know, too many people going to the hospital, most of them like with quarantine and staying at home, they're coming out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so you... that's, oh, sorry. So that's what I'm, I'm right now understanding. Okay. Um, uh, can you tell me uh, what you know about the various vaccines available to the public and how you feel about these vaccines? Um, what, you know, the, the Moderna and Pfizer are the ones that I've um, heard about most and that my, uh, that I have gotten, my, my family members have gotten is a Moderna and Pfizer. And uh, it's what I've heard, they're both, um, working well as far as you know it's not gonna prevent us from getting it but maybe not getting it as bad as if we don't get vaccinated so i mean that that's what i understand right now yes they both have side effects and um some people are getting the side effects and some people are not showing any any type of of, of the side effects mm -hmm. Do you have a vaccination story you would like to share with me now or perhaps later in the interview? Um, vaccination story, well, just a personal. I, I got the vaccine. I took my second dose. Um, the second dose did give me some of the side effects, but nothing major where I could not handle it. I just got some chills, a low-grade fever, and, and the, the fatigue for about 24 hours. And after that, I mean, everything was good. A little bit of soreness in my arm, but that was that was it. And right now, the only thing that I see is that it's hard for people to, to find vaccines, to register. They, you know, some people can't find the vaccines because they, they the appointments fill up really fast and they're having trouble. They're put on waiting lists and, you know, it's just, I, I think they should try to do something a little bit better to get people vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, do any of your family members hold the same beliefs as you about COVID-19 or, or are there some that take it more serious or lightly? I believe um, that mostly everybody is taking it serious some more because of their their medical histories and taking more precautions. I know there's some that may be more lenient that are still, not that they don't believe the coronavirus is not real, but they feel they can still go out and you know be out there. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other family members that rather stay at home, stay away from family and you know practice the social distancing to its fullest, but mainly because of, of their own um, medical history where they have to be careful. Okay. Okay, for these next set of questions, I want to ask you a bit more about your work and other topics such as where your interest in becoming a nurse came from and uh, some of the responsibilities that come from being a nurse, okay? 
Okay. All right. I like to start off with your upbringing. What inspired you to become a nurse? So when you were younger, uh, can you share with me what is like uh, getting your degree to become a nurse also? Okay, I um, from a young age, um, I always like taking care of of, of people. I I would say, um, from my personal experience, my mother had um, a, a lot of medical issues, and I was the one that would kind of was led like to take care of her. Uh, even from when I was young, one, because my mother was only spoke Spanish. So sometimes we would go to the doctors and I was the one to, to try to help her out to translate for her to tell the doctor what was wrong. So I was always taking care. I was always like the caregiver. And so that helped me, you know, with wanting to be a nurse, wanting to help people to take care of people. And, and that's where led me to becoming a nurse, even though I didn't do it right away after graduation. It took me 20 years after I graduated for me to go and get my degree as a licensed vocational nurse. And as soon as I got it and I, you know, I, I love what I do. I love taking care of people, you know, and that fulfills me. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been a, a vocational nurse? I've been a vocational nurse for 13 years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what, what was like your drive? Uh, what kept uh, the spark alive and the interest alive uh, into your adulthood? The, um, what kept it alive and, and, and what keeps me going is my, Okay, the, the job that I did the most was a, so far was a private duty. And what what I'd like most is seeing the progress um, that the patients are able to make, that I've made a difference, um, that I can help them out and, and um, see, you know, that there's progress being made. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I can keep them healthy out of the hospital and you know that just keeps me going. Mm -hmm. And in those 13 years, uh, how many children have you had the privilege to work with? Uh, as a private duty nurse, I have I've worked with. Uh, let me see. I think I've worked with about seven different patients mm -hmm. that I've worked, and some. Uh, with not as severe, some of them were on a trach ventilator, and some of them not so severe, but they all needed, you know, that um, that help, you, you know, to keep them healthy, to keep them safe, and you know, for make sure that their medications are administered on time, make sure that they uh, go to their medical appointments to their therapy sessions and just to give them the best quality of life that they can have. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that it was a very tough job and I'm also wondering uh, while working as a private duty nurse were there any times where you felt like quitting or change, um, having a change of career? Uh, it is because sometimes it's, it's very tough because um, at times we, and, and I'm not only speaking for myself because I know a lot of nurses that do private duty run into the same problems as to where we we are keeping the, the child as safe and as healthy as we can. And then let's say on a weekend, we, we don't work the weekends. We go back on a Monday and that child, something has happened. They're, they're sick and, and they're sick sometimes because there might be a little bit of negligence there on their family's part or you know, they didn't administer a medication and that set them back a bit. So it is sometimes a bit frustrating in that sense. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and yes, sometimes I felt like not working there anymore and stuff. But then I would see my patient and see, you know, they you feel that they need you and and that overcomes everything else and you 
you keep going back and you keep pushing forward and keep them healthy and and just keep going mm -hmm. and 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 what fulfills you is when you see that progress that they're making um speaking from a personal um experience that when i started working with a patient that i lasted nine years when i started with her she could not hold her head up straight sitting in her wheelchair and i worked so much with her to to help her you know up to now she can sit straight up in her wheelchair she can sit on the floor for a little while on her own and those were things that she was not able to do and so when i see things like that you know and i was part of it that just that is the best part that's very amazing to hear about um i know you said that it, your responsibilities were to uh keep them healthy and to keep them functioning but uh what other responsibilities were in your hand? Like if you could be specific with us. Um, the other responsibility is teaching the family their, their care, um, making sure that they know every aspect of their care, um, especially medications, what time of the medications are to be administered, uh, what medications are administered, where, what pharmacy you use, what doctors are you know are available in case um, it's a weekend and there's your your primary physician is not there, make sure that they know that they can take them to the to the emergency room. They can um, call an ambulance if it's an emergency. Call nine one one when disaster like hurricane season arrives. Make sure that they're registered with two one one in case that they need to be evacuated. You know, all all those things are play a, a big role in 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 these children's lives, and make sure that everything is said in case something happens. They have enough medications. Their 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 medical equipment is working at all times. Their feeding pumps, their suction machines, their ventilators, whatever medical equipment. Make sure they have enough supplies that they need, and you know, so that whatever they need, it's there. And mm -hmm. it's a lot of teaching the family and, you know, making sure that everybody knows everybody's on the same page and coordinate care with doctors, with therapists, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of um, care coordination with a lot of people. Uh -huh. um, uh, were there any more problems uh, besides uh, the parents and uh, uh, coordination? Um, sometimes, um, problems that I kind of ran into was, um, end of shift. Sometimes parent wasn't at home. Um, I couldn't leave because I cannot leave the patient alone. Or if I felt that the person that was at home was not able to take care of, of the patient adequately, I, I had to stay there too. So somebody was there, they felt that my patient is going to be safe. If I leave, they're going to be safe and I don't have to worry about anything happening. So those were some of the problems that I would run into where as to where no one was there to care for her at end of shift and I would have to wait longer. But, you know, we have to do what we have to do. Mm -hmm. Now, would you also say that you heard from other nurses in your field of duty uh, that deal with the same uh, problems and difficulties that you deal with? A lot of them do, uh, a lot of them do, and, and a lot of it is because sometimes we, we la like for me that I was there nine years, so the family kind of, um, I don't wanna say, well, they kind of get used to you, so they feel that, oh, okay, well, you know, she's okay, like she can wait and, uh, Kind of in a little bit, they take advantage of the fact that, that we're there and that we've known them for so long. And and um, and that happens quite a bit. All right, I'm going to transition into a different line of questioning. Uh, um, you said that uh, you are now working with the, the Westaco Independent School District. And- uh, Yes. yes. Uh, prior to that, you were a private duty nurse. How have both jobs been affected uh, by the pandemic? 
the as a private duty nurse uh the the way it's, it's affected in that field is um well we have to be very careful now going into the because we're at the patient's home we have to be careful uh, before we start our shift and, and ask the family. And we hope that the family is, is, is truthful in answering the questions, whether they have been out in public, they have had contact with someone that has COVID or themselves have tested positive. Before we, we start our shift, if we feel that they're not being truthful or that they do tell us, you know, we, we have someone positive, we need to report right away. We cannot go into the home and that affects the care for the patient because we cannot go in there because someone is a positive case. Um, so that's how it's changed now. Uh, of course, also being in the home now, we have to be in full PPE with our mask all day, gown, you know, just um, protection, uh, you know, all day long and at the, at the school district, the way it has affected is that, uh, like with with the children, also everybody has to wear a mask at the school. Um, uh, if any children show any kind of symptom, we have to send them home, get them cleared by medical doctor, then get them tested, or just as as they're cleared by a doctor before they can return to school. And also that puts a strain on the children. A lot of them. You know, just the other day, one student was asking me whether this COVID-19 was ever going to end because he's he was telling me that he's so tired of not being able to be with his friends, not being able to to participate with other kids, you know, playing like in the playground, stuff like that, that, you know, he's tired of, of that and, and that that affects the students a lot. Mm hmm. Have uh, both jobs uh, done a good job in uh, making you feel safe uh, during the pandemic? I believe, yes, that both of them have made me feel safe. Um, the school district is taking a lot of precaution, precautions. Uh, we get temperature checks. And of course, like I said, any, any symptom that any student or staff are showing they either they need to go home, go to the doctor, make sure they're cleared before they can come back. So yes, I believe you know I'm in a safe environment. At uh, any point, uh, did you have to quarantine yourself uh, uh, due to uh, any incidents in your job, either as a, a private duty nurse or a school nurse? Okay, the, uh, as a private duty nurse, I did uh, quarantine because. Uh, at the home where I was, one of the family members tested positive or was showing symptoms, it had not gotten tested, but for my own, for my own peace of mind, I, I got tested and because I, until I got my test results, I did, I did quarantine, um, only, you know, because it was for myself, peace of mind and test was negative, but you know, that was the only time I have not been in contact with anyone that has been um, COVID positive. No, you know, so no, I, I have not. Okay. Um, do you have any comment uh, on any other nurses? Like how has uh, that affected, it, it, how has the situation affected other nurses in your same line of duty? Um, I know that um, another private duty nurse that is a friend of mine, she was, um, she contracted COVID from a nurse that had covered a shift at the same home that she was. Um, and I believe she said that the nurse had worked in a nursing home, contracted COVID at the nursing home, worked at the home where my, my friend was working and my friend contact, contracted uh, the COVID-19, was very ill for, for a while, did not know but she did have and still does, you know, has some kind of respiratory uh, problems from the COVID-19. Okay. And 
According to the CDCN, as you said, all nurses that should follow the infection prevention and control recommendations for healthcare or personnel with, uh, which recommends that you should use uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, um, mm -hmm. face masks, either disposable cloth and the most recommended type, which is N95 mask or other equipment such as gowns, gloves, eye protection, as well as face shields. Has this been something that you struggle with? Has this been a struggle for you uh, to, uh, you know, knowing that you have to work eight hours a day constantly protecting yourself? Or is this something that you don't think too much of? Well, not, at the beginning, it was kind of a struggle, you know, trying to wear all the PPE. Um, right now at, at the school district, we wear our masks, um, the shields, if we are in contact with a student that has showing symptoms, we'll wear the shields, gloves, of course, not all day because um, wearing the gloves all day is, is um, not um, recommended because if you're wearing gloves every day, you're transferring germs from one place to another. So we only wear the gloves if needed while coming in contact with a child that has been coughing or or has um, a, a runny nose and stuff like that, we'll wear the gloves and the face shields once we come in contact with them. But other than that, it's just the, the, the mask. Mm -hmm. uh, has the school district that you work for done a good job at implementing the PPE rules within the staff and students? They do a very good job about it um, and the staff does very well also. We don't have anyone that, that you know, is, is saying like, well, you know, that doesn't wear it, everybody wears it. And, you know, there, I have not seen any problems as far as that aspect. Okay, so uh, does that mean that uh, students and staff are cooperating and like, has there been any conflicts in the past uh, or has there been no conflicts uh, to your knowledge? At, at the beginning, at the beginning, uh, when students were gonna return to in school, um, when they said that they, they would be able to go into the school, uh, we had some parents that were um, complaining because they didn't want their students to be wearing masks all day. But once, you know, we started, telling them why the masks were required and why the temperature checks also are required. They, they're they compliant. Now the parents are very also very compliant. Not We don't really have anyone that, you know, tells us that they don't want them to wear masks or anything like that. They're, okay. They're compliant. And that was very nice to hear. Um, as a working mother, do you feel like it, you've been doing a good job of following the guidelines to keep yourself and your family safe? Um, as a working mother, yes, I, I try to do the best. Also, you know, keep telling my, my children, you know, the importance of social distancing, the wearing their masks, washing their hands. So I believe, yes, that I have been doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned before that uh, you got calls from other nurses that have contracted the disease from uh, homes they've worked on. And uh, do you mm -hmm. feel you made the right decision stepping away from uh, private duty nursing and uh, got yourself a job at the school district? Do you feel that was the right I believe, I believe at this time, yes. I think that's the best decision that I that I made. Um, for for the time right now, I, I think that yes, that it was the best decision that I have made. I, I feel safer right now at the school district. Um, not saying that I would never do the private duty again. I believe once that this um, kind of uh, settles down a, a bit, and now with the vaccines and stuff like that, it's something that I I could do at, at a as a part time. Um, job also. I believe that you mentioned in the pre-interview, uh, students come uh, to the nurse's office claiming they're sick in order to be picked up by parents uh, so, uh, because they are ner nervous around other students. How does this make you feel that the students are going to the extent because they do not feel comfortable? 
Uh, yes, and, and we do, and actually we do get students that that feel nervous about being there at school. So, and they know that if they come and they know they, they're showing any kind of symptoms like the coughing or they tell us stomach aches or they might even tell us they, are, they have diarrhea that they will be sent home. And a lot of them already know that we will do that. And just because they do not, they don't feel safe there at school, they come and tell us or they fake the coughs. And we have to believe what the student is telling us. We can't say, oh, he's faking it. So we do send them home. And a lot of them, unfortunately, will do that just to leave school. Um, have parents uh, been cooperative in terms of just following the guidelines and keeping their children home if they show any symptoms? Um, there, there's, we're still having a, a, some issues with that because there's a lot of parents that will still send them to school, you know, knowing that they're coughing, that they have runny noses, um, they'll still send them to school. But teachers are also very good at, at um, letting us know when they notice that their students are, are experiencing any symptoms they let us know and, and we'll assess the student. And if we feel that, yes, you know, they, they are showing those symptoms, we, we send them home. Um, and of course they need to go get cleared by the doctor or get tested. And, and once they get their clearance, they can come back the next day if, if, they're, if they're okay. Um, where, where do you think that uh, the students uh, contract the symptoms or contract uh, COVID-19? I believe a lot of them um, um, from, because mainly the, the cases that we're showing at the school because we track students and we track staff and mostly it's the staff that has contracted the, the virus rather than the students. There hasn't been too many students, but mostly it's the staff. So I believe like a lot of the, the students that have gotten it, it's either family members gathering together and things like that, not, you know, from student to student. Oh, okay. Oh. And, and for us, another problem that I feel that here that we have is a lot of them will travel to Mexico since we're so close to the border and a lot of them have family members, you know, that live over there and they travel back and forth. That's also another big issue that, that we have at the, at the school district where they have foreign travel. We also have guidelines that we need to follow for that. They need to get tested when they come back and quarantine for seven days. You know, if they don't want to test, then they have to quarantine for, for 10 days. Oh, okay. So uh, there's, uh, uh, so there are special guidelines for travel and uh, yes. for if a student uh, has traveled that they need to be quarantined? Yes. Oh. The wow. student or staff that travel to Mexico uh, have to, have to, they have to let us know and then they have to test three to five days after they have traveled and stay home seven days. Yeah. And if they don't want to test, then they have to stay home for 10 days. Um. I know that the pandemic has caused uh, other problems uh, such as uh, job loss. Uh, do you have any coworkers that you know of that have lost their jobs? Uh, do uh, you uh, no, um, I don't have any coworkers that, that lost their jobs due to the, to, due to the pandemic. Um, myself and my husband have been very fortunate that we kept on working. We didn't lose our jobs and no, I cannot really say. Um, well, my daughter lost her job because she had just gotten hired at, at a job. And when the pandemic hit, um, she lost her job, was out of work for a, for a few months, but was able to, to find another job and, and she's back working. So no, that's the only person that I can say that I know that lost their job. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to do another transition for these next set of questions. I want to ask you how your children have been handling the pandemic since uh, you have one teenager, three adults, and with two, um, and, uh, two, uh, two with full-time jobs, also dealing with 
uh, stress uh, that comes with not seeing your family and uh, having a grandchild with special needs? The, how that has affected um, the, the teenage child that I have at home that's in school, she's currently experience, experiencing some depression. Um, she has voiced, you know, that she wants to go back to school, you know, um, and I believe that depression comes from, from just being here, trying to do her work online that is a very big struggle and um and yes you know being away from from our older children and a grandson that i have with special needs that that has been very hard because we're not able to to see them as often we not able to get together as often and that has put a strain and and causes emotional stress mm -hmm. Uh, was uh, there anyone in your family that has contracted the disease? Yes, there, there are several family members. Um, they contracted, but they recovered, and we had one that, that did pass away in, in July. I'm very sorry for your loss. And, I and that one, um, it was, it hit hard because once they go into the hospital, you, you can't see them, you can't talk to them, you know, they pass and they're alone. Mm -hmm. And that is, is something very hard. And then the funeral, it's also hard because you can't be there really like uh, they had guidelines, only certain people, only a few people could be there. And, and that was also stressful and that is very hard. Mm -hmm. I bet, and I'm very sorry for your loss. That everything has been going well after. Um, all right, I'm gonna to transition to this next question. How about schooling? As you mentioned, you said you have four children, one is a teenager. How has school been for her? And how has the process of learning been different uh, since she's dealing with online classes and you said that she's been dealing with depression um, due to online I, I believe that that it, it has been very hard. I mean, the learning process, because you're, you know, you need that, um, when you're learning, you need to be there, like in front of the teacher to ask questions, things like that. And right now it has been hard because a lot of it uh, has to be done on their own and, and you know, it, it's just things that she doesn't under, understand and having problems with certain classes. And it has just been something very hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and not only for her, for many students, mm -hmm. trying to do the, the online is, is hard. And I, I mean, I don't know how, how they, they can do it. <laughs> Um, has COVID-19 affected your family members in any other way? I know you said that you lost a family member. Your uh, daughter is having some emotional issues, uh, but have there been any financial issues or any more uh, mental and emotional issues that happened to anybody else? Financial issues uh, that I know of? No. Um, mainly just um, no um, emotional a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. um, with, you know, like I said, with my teenage daughter, with my son in college, you know, I know uh, anxiety, you know, played a big role, you know, when he's doing his online classes and, and you know, and, and all I can say is right now, just do the best you can, you know, and, and every, it's, you're not the only one going through this. A lot of people are going through the same thing so that's, you know, the, my only way that I can kind of encourage them to just, you know, try to do the best that they can. And uh, you yourself, how do you deal with the stress of not being able to see a family the way you want or would be able to before the pandemic hit? It, 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 it is hard. Um, I try to keep in touch with family members 
phone, text, you know, as much as I can, you know, just, you know, that's the only way that we can communicate right now. I know that hopefully soon we will be able to, to get together to kind of get pretty much to the place where we were at before. But for now, we just have to deal with, with what, what it is for right now to, for our own safety and for their safety too, because I know like my older family members, I know they've got medical issues. I, I always think I don't want to take something to them, you know, and, and then for them to end up getting sick, things like that. I just rather stay away, even though I know, you know, it hurts because I miss them. Mm -hmm. But I do, you know, try to keep in touch with them, at, you know, by phone, by text, as much as I can. All right. Um, now, for your children that are adults, how are their lives right now uh, adjusting to the whole pandemic and like the world around us? How, how have they adjusted? Um, I know that um, they're they're doing pretty well. They mostly keep, you know, like doing the same, keeping their precautions. My daughter, it, my adult daughter is the one that has her son with special needs. I know she doesn't go out too much. Uh, she's still, she's um, more cautious and more because of my grandson, you know, with his special needs and things like that. She doesn't want to send him to school and which is fine. You know, I just feel that what she's doing is the best, you know, that she's doing for her family. And that's all I tell them, whatever they feel is right for that, their family, that's what they need to do. Having a grandchild with special needs, uh, do you and your daughter share the same worries uh, for his well-being such uh, since COVID strikes harsher with children and adults uh, that are at higher at risk as yes. well as with yes. your other younger grandchildren? I feel, yes. I mean, I, I tell her, like, uh, take a lot of precautions with him. You know, don't, don't take him out too much. If he doesn't have to go to school, don't send him to school even though I know that the school is safe, but you know, I just feel that he's safer at home for now mm -hmm. and he should be kept at home. Okay. Now with your son who attends a uh, university, how has it been for him? And do you have any concerns about him going back to in-person learning uh, this fall? For him, yes. I mean, it, it's been very hard for him also. I know he has felt a lot of anxiety with his online classes. One because he and and he's used to going to tutoring and and things like that and and doing online it's it's a lot different. But like I said, I just um, tell him you know he's doing great, just to do the best that he can. I I do worry that he's going to go back back to school in person, but I know that he's he is intelligent enough and to follow all precautions to wear his mask to you know do what he needs to do he's he's he knows what he needs to do and i'm i'm comfortable that he'll be safe you mentioned that also that you are married how has your husband uh been as such as finances jobs and keeping safe my husband has uh financially he's been good he kept his job didn't lose his job or anything like that. I do worry a little bit because, well, where he works, it actually it's only three people that work there, including himself, but one of the persons has already contracted the virus twice. But I like, I always tell him, you stay, you're six feet apart, make sure you wear your mask, be careful. And you know that that person has already gotten it twice kind of stay away if you don't need to be close to that person don't and and as so far everything has turned out good he's already gotten his vaccine and you know that makes me just a little bit more comfortable do you show gratitude that you and your husband were able to keep your jobs with steady income yes i we did you know we're able to keep our jobs and that it helps a lot because you know we don't we didn't worry too much about things going on um 
we were working, we kept working, didn't um, lose any hours, anything like that. We just, we kept working our, our full-time jobs. Okay. Um, now uh, we are actually nearing the end of our interview. So I'm just gonna give you uh, some closing questions and a final statement, okay? Okay. Are you satisfied with uh, the local response to COVID-19 in Wessico, Texas? I am. I am. I am satisfied with with the way they um, um, they have been running things. You know, when uh, the cases started rising, they they shut down. They implemented the curfews and they were strict about it. So uh, yes, I I was very pleased with with how everything was handled. Are you satisfied with the state response to COVID led by? It? Texas and Governor Greg Abbott? At the beginning I was, and once he decided to open everything 100%, that was, that became worrisome because he's telling them there's no mask mandate and, and things like that, and everything's gonna open at 100%. That is still worrisome because now there's a lot of people out there that don't wanna wear their masks and they don't have to. You know, but I am glad that a lot of businesses are still requiring that we wear masks, that we do social distance. So, you know, I, I wasn't happy with the governor's decision, but I'm happy that a lot of businesses and places are still requiring, you know, the masks and then the social distancing. Are you satisfied with the, the current nation's response to COVID-19 led by President Biden and his administration? I am, I am, uh, I'm happy with, with, you know, the way he's um, pushing for the vaccine, the, the still give the mask mandates. Yes, I am. If you had the power to respond to COVID-19 with policies, laws, or workplace decisions, uh, what would you do differently, if anything? I would say just, you know, um, keep implementing the the social distancing you know mandatory mandatory masks you know just it, it keep doing that because it does work it does work are there any other stories or experiences you would like to share with me that i have not asked about i i believe that i have shared um, mostly everything that i could think of Okay. Is there anything else that you would like to ask? Uh, no, ma'am. I think uh, that'll be all. Thank you so much, Mrs. Bettis, uh, for your participation with UTRGV's Voices Oral History Project. Your story was an interesting one. I hope you continue to stay safe and that your family members and anyone uh, that you hold close stay strong. Um, goodbye and have a very lovely day. Thank you, you're welcome.